The results of two by-elections in the United Kingdom indicate the extent of the challenge before Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the ruling Conservative Party. Now, the Conservative lost the elections in the constituencies of Kingswood and Wellingborough by substantial margins to Labour Party. And this gives a sense of the kind of headwinds that the Conservative uh, Party will, uh, will face. It's deeply unpopular. Many of its policies are hated by the people. And the country's economy has slipped into a recession. Now, the Labour Party does seem to have a lot of advantages. But it also has failed to present a very serious or substantial alternative policy agenda. To understand the politics of the United Kingdom at this point and what lies ahead in the elections, we go to Anish. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Let's take a look at these by-election results. Quite a severe blow to the Conservative Party months ahead of the election. First, take us through what these constituencies were, you know, what was the situation and what is the kind of outcome that happened. Yes, Prashant, the results are quite significant uh, in multiple ways. One is definitely the fact that both the seats that went into by-elections were uh, conservative strongholds. They have been held uh, by the Conservative Party for years together. Uh, for instance, Wellingborough was held since 2005. So nearly 20 years of conservative uh, representation from that constituency has been brought to an end. And Kingswood, uh, another uh, conservative stronghold, uh, has been held by the party since 2010. So nearly one and a half decade of uh, conservative hold on the constituency uh, came down. And this is also nothing new at this point in time. Uh, there have been 11 by-elections that have happened since the Rishi Sunak government has come into place. And uh, in the 11, the conservatives have only won a single seat, uh, which is at Spritch and Uxbridge and South Ruislip. Now, uh, in that case, the result was actually an upset and uh, the conservative candidate who won, who was Steve Tuckworth, uh, won by a very small and reduced margin of something around 500 votes. So it's uh, it's quite a significant turn of events yeah, and it's a consistent trend that has been going on for the past year or so. Uh, against uh, how uh, how the wave, there's a wave of anti incumbency that has been quite consistently going on uh, uh, under the Sunak government, and there has been no let off on this matter. Uh, many multiple seats have been flipped, uh, mostly by the Labour Party, clearly showing that the Labour Party is currently holding momentum, uh, primarily because it is taking advantage of the of the anti-incumbency against the government because the conservatives have really uh, failed to take care of several uh, you know, daily uh, bread and butter issues for uh, the British people at this point in time. Uh, the cost of living crisis is still there even though it has there has been a let up uh, over the past uh, couple of months. Uh, it is still, the after effects are still quite prevalent and on top of that, the government has been pushing for several anti-democratic moves, trying to, uh, you know, block or ban uh, protest strikes, uh, strike the trade union strikes, uh, or any kind of workers' mobilization. Uh, very recently, there has been an attempt to target Palestinian uh, protesters, uh, and all of this has definitely uh, clearly shows that uh, there has been an impact uh, that is. Uh, only chipping away at conservative base at this point, uh, at the at the advantage of opposition groups, whoever is the strongest, and in this case, the Labour Party being the more organised of the of a na and the na with a national profile among all the opposition parties is definitely gaining from these uh, from conservative weakness. Right, Anish, like we said, few months left for the elections and already there's this multiple reports stating that Labour definitely has an advantage. Uh, so what are the situations as far, what is the situation as far as both the parties are concerned based on various polls, based on various estimates, what does this political situation look like now? Yes, so the, as I said, like there is a general trend of anti-incumbency and the Conservatives have not been able to plug that uh, kind of bleeding of their votes. Uh, that has been uh, that has been seen uh, over the past couple of years now, actually, uh, and, and it's not just uh, a Sunak uh, government uh, uh, hallmark. Uh, it has been happening under uh, the previous uh, since at least the Boris Johnson government, where the Conservatives have been losing uh, quite a few of their very significant seats. Uh, but you know, since most of the by-elections have happened very recently. 
uh, and in most cases, pretty much all of the cases that has happened under the Sunak government, it has happened primarily uh, because of uh, you know one of the other con conservative uh, party leader being held up in uh, some kind of scandal. So, uh, and there has been no uh, you know uh, no success by the Tories to actually regain uh, people's confidence, even bringing back some of the. Uh, you know, the older leaders like David Cameron uh, is brought back as one of the significant uh, uh, members of the cabinet. And even that hasn't actually uh, favored the conservatives at this point in time. Uh, so it clearly shows that there has been nearly 14 years of conservative rule has really not made, uh, uh, you know, an impact that is the legacy is now for all to see. Uh, the post-COVID uh, United Kingdom is really uh, seeing the after effects of you know, conservative, uh, more than a decade of conservative rule and how that has actually impacted the economy, uh, the posture of Brexit process, uh, the whole COVID-19 mismanagement that uh, really exacerbated uh, the cost of living crisis in the post-COVID-19 uh, era. All of this has come to really uh, bite back the conservatives. On the other hand, the Labour Party is making gains, but uh, this is only uh, kind of emboldening uh, uh, the current establishment Tory light Labour uh, leadership right now. And that is another part of the concern, so, because in many cases, uh, their policies or the policies that they're trying to push for uh, are pretty much uh, are not that, uh, you know, in opposition with the Conservatives. Uh, agenda, at least in the economic front. So in many of these cases, uh, the, fa uh, the fact that there has been very little difference um, between uh, the Labour and the Conservatives is also a matter of concern for many of the progressives uh, in the UK who see that like growing uh, Labour victories will only embolden the tory light version of the Labour Party rather than the more progressive ones who are actually doing much of the work at the grassroots right now. Thank you so much, Anish. But do stay back. We'll come back to you for the next story as well. On February 16th, that is Friday, tens of thousands of people across India observed what is called the Grameen Band or the Rural Shutdown. Now, this was mainly done by farmers' organizations, by workers' organizations, which have been collaborating, working together. And of course, I, this is connected to the historic farmers' protests from two years ago. Meanwhile, farmers have also been protesting on the borders of the Indian states of Punjab and Haryana. A large number of farmers gathered there. All these demands by these protesting farmers and workers very similar. A lot has to do with what is called the minimum support price or the MST, which was also one of the MSP, which was also one of the key demands of the protest two years ago, but has not been fulfilled. To understand what these protests are, what are the demands, we go back to Anish. Welcome back, Anish. The farmers' agitation right now, both the rural shutdown that took place yesterday and the ongoing protest uh, on the borders of the states of Punjab and Haryana, uh, clear echoes of what happened two years ago and many of the demands are quite similar too. So maybe could you take us through what these demands are, why are the farmers at this point, just months before the election, staging these protests? Yes, Prashant. So let's begin with some of the main demands that farmers are calling for in the current round of negotiations as well. Uh, Obviously, at the top of it uh, is the minimum support price for uh, farm produce. A minimum support price is basically an assured, uh, legally assured uh, pricing system that would uh, ensure that farmers make profit uh, or at least recover the cost and make up, uh, you know, some surplus out of their uh, of our, out of their produce, which could actually help them in you know continuing the production process itself. Uh, now, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the, there is a massive uh, farming distress, rural distress across India is primarily because farmers often do not get to recover uh, the cost of their produce. And especially uh, if they are, uh, you know, engaged in producing or farming uh, essential uh, commodities, food grains, uh, and, you know, who are not in the cash crop industry, they are the ones who are far worse off, it's not like the cash crop industry is better, uh, you know, or, or are doing far better. Uh, they are also facing losses very, uh, you know, very routinely, but it's the food grains and the, the farmers who are engaged in production of food grains uh, are the ones who are the far worst affected at this point in time. And there is also this, 
this also multiplies into a food crisis, a farming crisis, an agricultural crisis. That is something that is widespread at this current point in time across India. Uh, on top of that, uh, they are calling for loan waivers uh, from banks and uh, NBFCs. NBF, sorry, NBFCs are non-banking finance corporations or companies. Uh, they are uh, so the farmers are calling for loan waivers. Now, loan and debt crisis across the farming sector, especially for far, small farmers, is something that has uh, led to death of uh, nearly 200,000 farmers across India, as per certain estimates. So this is a massive crisis uh, 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 that has been going on since the mid-90s, and it has remained unaddressed. And uh, loan waivers are one of the ways that farmers are saying would actually support them uh, and help them regain their production capability. In many cases, uh, very often farmers commit suicide because foreclosures are being imposed on them, uh, on their lands, which pretty much renders them without a livelihood and their families without a livelihood. So suicides are you know, really seen as this is the kind of tragedy uh, that is widespread across India in most places and especially in north of India, uh, where uh, there is an intensively uh, massive uh, farming distress that is also that also remains unaddressed. Uh, another part of this is the uh, of the demands is the scrapping of the Electricity Amendment Act. Uh, the Electricity Amendment Act is pretty much uh, does one uh, one of the ways it impacts uh, farmers is basically it takes out subsidized electricity consumption. Uh, which is kind of important for uh, farmers uh, to, uh, you know, offset some of the cost of electricity uh, usage for their farming process. Uh, bringing it out would actually uh, increase their cost. Uh, again, uh, just only uh, multiplying the already widespread distress. And obviously, the last one, the suspension of Ajay Mishra, uh, you mean minister. Uh, uh, of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the ruling BJP of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He, is, his, uh, he was uh, implicated in protecting his son, Ashish Mishra, uh, who is one of the suspects of the Lakhimpur Kheri uh, uh, killings, in which he is said to have driven the car that killed about four farmers and a journalist and, you know, offset a violent uh, uh, struggle between farmers and the police at the time. Uh, it pretty much was one of the most gruesome uh, incidents throughout the farming, uh, the farmers protest that act that India witnessed a couple of years ago. And this is uh, something that farmers have been demanding for a very long time. Uh, Ajay, uh, Ashish Mishra and uh, continues to evade uh, prosecution by uh, much of it. He, uh, he in fact went into hiding at the time. Uh, there are multiple witnesses who saw him driving the car and running away from the scene. Uh, Ajay Mishra had come, continued to protect him and is still one of the senior most leaders and, uh, in the BJP who continues to retain his position. So these are some of the main demands that farmers have put forward in their, uh, in their current set of uh, protest in the, in, to, the, uh, to the national capital of Delhi. Right, Anish, and also could you give us a sense of the scale of the protests, what has been happening on the ground as part of these protests? The situation on the ground is quite dramatic right now. Uh, pretty much uh, gov the government of Haryana, which is the neighboring state uh, to Delhi, the national capital, uh, is trying to block roads, highways uh, uh, with, you know, significant uh, level of uh, blocks and blockades, pretty much blockading the entire capital. Uh, blocking off uh, all major roads that lead to the capital, uh, you know, some of the busiest highways, in fact. And this is something uh, that that they're, they're going to uh, continue indefinitely as long as the farmers uh, decide to go on with the struggle. Uh, there is also, uh, you know, attempts by the government to, uh, you know, suppress the protests in many ways. Uh, there are currently negotiations ongoing, but no results are yet to arrive. Uh, on top of that, uh, recently, uh, one of the things that we had across India was the Grameen Bund. 
or the rural strike that happened across India in which an estimated 200 million people had participated. Uh, in that, uh, you, you had uh, trade unions, farmers' movements across the country participating in strike across different sectors as well. And in response to that, very recently, we have seen the government of Uttar Pradesh, uh, the largest, uh, the most populous uh, state in the country, uh, which is led by BJP, obviously, uh, uh, impose a six-month ban on strikes for public servants. Uh, pretty much uh, because uh, several public servants were part of the rural strike that actually took place yesterday. So in all in all, we are seeing farmers continuing uh, with their demands, uh, standing their ground. On the other hand, we see significant repression from the government using all sorts of state machinery to make sure that they get scuttled, they can, uh, to make sure that farmers do not reach Delhi uh, the way they did uh, a couple of years ago and uh, you know at, at a time uh, because it's quite close to the general elections that are set to happen uh, between April and May and so they really do not want any kind of uh, they do not want the optics of being seen as anti-farmer in a country where most of the uh, you know in a country that that is mostly reliant on agriculture uh, to sustain itself so this is definitely a situation that the government is trying to diffuse, or if not able to diffuse, they're trying to suppress it. But in both cases, the, uh, the results are not in favor of the government right now. Uh, while the far farmers continue to uh, dug their heels, uh, dig their heels in, into their demands and stand their ground on the movement right now. Thank you once again, Anish. We'll come back to you next week with more segments for Daily Debrief. And that's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back with a fresh daily debrief next week. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button.